um, we are going to stay with um, uh, camp and settlement uh, planning. Um, and we have another presentation from UN Habitat, Habitat next, um, uh, Bernard Heng. Um, I don't know if you're able to share your screen. Um, there we go. OK, great. Um, over to you. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, given the lead time limit that uh, we have, I'll quickly dive in. Yeah. So yeah, thanks a lot, the uh, everyone for joining this session. Um, let me just quickly share a uh, full screen. So uh, before I start, uh, I would like to first introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Bernard Heng, a field officer with UN Habitat's Kakuma Field Office. Uh, which is one of the locations that spatial, spatial profiling focused on. And uh, I'm also joined by Jia Chong An from uh, UN Habitat HQ to present one of our normative projects titled The Participatory Approaches in Camp or Settlement Planning in the New Normal. Um, it is about looking at past practices and learning from them and improving on them for future activities. So more importantly, we are looking at participatory approaches from the perspective of our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the objective of today's presentation is to provide an introduction to the discussion. Uh, there might not be uh, enough time for good discussions. Hence, we have already shared the link in the chat and we'll keep the board open till 5th July for participants to leave their comments. And also in light of the, the time we have for this discussion, uh, we would like to focus on two key problem statements for participants to keep in their mind while we go through this session itself. The first is how can practitioners better conduct uh, participatory exercises and the second is how can practitioners better engage beneficiaries and participants and what are the tools and methods that we can adapt and improve in these different contexts. So uh, before I dive in into our, the evaluation of our participatory approaches so far, we would like to first give an introduction into our context of our analysis. So Kakuma Kalabeye is located in Takana, northern Kenya. As you can see in the maps over here, uh, Kenya, Takana, and uh, northern Kenya, uh, northern Takana, western Takana. Sorry. So um, Kakuma Kalabe uh, hosts refugees uh, both in Kakuma refugee camp and Kalabe settlements, and this contributes to it being one of the densest region in the county itself. Uh, UN Habitat has been leading the spatial planning and infrastructure thematic working group uh, under KISTEP which uh, focuses on integration of hosts and refugees in color Bay settlement. So it's a uh, color Bay settlement is a pilot model for hosts and refugees to live together. Our work aims to improve urban infra infrastructures, public spaces, services, livelihoods, and more. So participatory approaches has always since 2016 been integral to UN Habitat's work and support us to better address their needs and existing gaps. So if you will look at uh, the three maps over here, uh, yep, it's lagging a bit. Um, this, this different maps showcases to the dynamic uh, uh, changes that Kakuma Kala Bay is facing itself from the potential growth in uh, 10 years time to the number of different plans that are upcoming, including a uh, major LAPSAP corridor, which is uh, infrastructure connecting uh, the Kenya, Lamu coast to uh, South Sudan. Um, so with this in mind, participatory approaches are also increasingly important as the context of Kakuma Kalo Bay becomes more dynamic with growing opportunities. There is uh, this increasing opportunities, as I have mentioned, uh, in the north to connect with neighboring countries such as uh, South Sudan, Uganda, and Ethiopia, or even with uh, in the region with NORAP counties, uh, the counties surrounding Takana itself and other towns in Takana. So this region has also recorded increasing rural, urban rural migration as the host communities settle in the area looking for opportunities. Hence, participatory approaches is really a key strategy for UN Habitat to ensure that planning remains relevant to these dynamic needs, wants, and hopes of the different stakeholders. So now that we have an idea of the context itself, we will cover some of the key points uh, in our analysis. Likewise, in uh, light of the time that we have in this session, we'll be only concentrating on one of the themes that we have identified, which is participation in planning processes. 
So uh, before I go in depth into it, uh, overall, UN Habitat has split the evaluation and recommendations uh, with regards to participation into five key things. First, it's overall planning processes. Second, it's stakeholders. Third, spatial data. Fourth, methodology. And fifth, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and how it will influence participatory approaches in the new normal itself. So in today's presentation, we will focus on our analysis of the overall planning processes, the lessons learned and the different gaps. So building upon this, you have that in terms recommends for improvements to the process in the new normal. Um, so the planning process itself, the overall planning process itself is split into six key phases, uh, which is one project proposal, uh, project inception, baseline assessment, and uh, settlement profiling, uh, in which uh, spatial profiling that was presented before does fall under this space. Uh, concept development, plan formulation, and last of all, monitoring and evaluation itself. So at each point, what we are trying to do is we are trying to analyze the different activities under each space itself, and how participation of the community can be either further improved or integrated. So some of the key points that are raised here are also relevant to planning in other contexts. Uh, for example, UN Habitat has recognized that there is opportunity in, in including the community at the project proposal stage to define the problem statement so that we can together with the community submit it for fundraising. So this in, in, in cons, resource constrained environments like uh, refugee settlements in Makala Bay, this allows limited resources to be better directed. So another point that we realized is is that involving uh, the community early on in the process uh, allows for a very agile and dynamic planning process, which is especially important in contexts that lack data and is constantly changing. For example, with the ever-shifting uh, refugee population and demographics. So another key point in, uh, in, is that in con resource-constrained context, it is difficult to engage the community at large. We cannot hold participatory workshops for a 200,000 strong population itself. So one of the challenges that we have faced, for example, is that uh, it, to, to sustain momentum, it's important that the participants of our capacity building of our participatory activities will go go on to pollinate the ideas and learnings to the rest of the community. But we have been facing challenges with that in that uh, most, of, most of the time, whatever we have been discussing in these kind of workshops or activities are limited to that only. And it doesn't go beyond, they don't talk about it with the community. So this really limits uh, long-term impacts itself. Um, another recommendation from UN Habitat under a planning process is that, for example, uh, we should start to look at uh, under plan formulation, where, where different stakeholders can come together uh, to use participatory act activ activities as a platform to encourage different stakeholders to come together and support plan formulation. The, the key point is that we need beyond we need to go beyond just having different groups of community within one session itself. We need to start to look at having communities, experts, agencies, authorities all together in a single activity. Uh, as this is very important for changing, uh, exchanging of perspectives and encouraging for uh, collective understanding and support on the way forward itself. So lastly, another key point that I would like to share is that uh, I know this is very, very difficult uh, and I don't really know of uh, any examples in other contexts, but UN Habitat does see value after our analysis in involving the community, which are typical laymen uh, and are not planners or engineers like us, for example, in producing the final outputs. This could mean publications, they could, this could mean our final master planning, for, for example. Because this, this, by involving the community, by involving the layman, it will encourage these outputs to be developed in accessible manners that is understood by the rest of the community. Uh, it sort of forces it. And by having accessible publications, it will help to bring more and more community on board to support the planning processes and eventually ho hopefully support for the next project proposal 2.0, for example. So yeah, this is largely uh, a, a very quick overview of uh, our analysis of participation in our planning process itself. Uh, but if anything, we would like you to take away from this session itself is that one key recommendation uh, is that largely, UN Habitat's experience in participatory activities since 2016 has showed that there is further opportunity to elevate participation of the community up 
are installing ladder of citizen participation. Essentially, to give them more control over the planning processes itself. Uh, and a way to do, do it, one key recommendation is to integrate the community further as associate expert, experts to not only feedback, but also steer uh, the processes, which harkens uh, sentiments from Asian development banks, building capacity through participation publication. You'll see this later on, uh, this publication later on in the, the later slides. So um, one key strategy that we agreed with them is that, especially in context of resource constrained settlements, is that we need to nurture a group of champions in the community itself and build their capacity, not only in planning, but also participatory processes. Essentially, how can they help us to facilitate the community? And as, as facilitators, this will help, help them bridge the gap between the experts, the so-called experts, and the community, community itself, which is very essential in supporting for better conversations and eventually more relevant and sustainable outputs. So yeah, that, that is a very quick overview of our analysis in planning processes, but uh, we would also like to share more of some of the key recommendations that we think is relevant to other contexts that share similar characteristics as Kakuma Kalabe. For example, working with multiple stakeholders or having a resource constrained environment with potential lack of uh, a strong updated database, for example. So um, a key recommendation, uh, a, shared by, a key approach shared by the different recommendations in these different teams, right, is that we focus on lowering the barriers to participation for all stakeholders in the community. So this could be persons with disabilities, this could be age-wise in terms of women or, or, or elderly, or even gender-wise in terms of women, for example. So yeah, this involves really understanding their needs and developing different multiple uh, participatory approaches and also outputs that is suited to all. So uh, we recognize that the one size fit more model does not work, especially in participation. So for example, um, it is very critical that we must first start off by identifying challenges faced by different groups in the population itself. And then from understanding these challenges, develop accessible materials for them so that they can actively and more truly, genuinely participate in the activities itself. So at the same time, we also recognize that uh, in, in contexts like this, it's impossible to do a very comprehensive and perfect stakeholder, uh, stakeholder mapping. So it's very essential that we continue to integrate our stakeholder mapping into participatory activities so that we can continue to develop a comprehensive and updated list of stakeholders. This is especially important uh, with new vulnerable groups created from the impacts of COVID-19 itself. So um, UNF that also sees the importance of converting spatial data into accessible materials. And one of the very good examples is from the presentation before, spatial profiling, uh, in which uh, area-based approach really facilitates for this, this accessible uh, materials for different participate, uh, different communities, uh, different groups of the community, sorry. So by relying, for example, on accessible mappings, it will help the community to understand and better feedback to the planning processes. Most of the community members that we have worked with uh, don't really understand statistics and data in terms of pie charts and graphs, but it, once translated to maps, once, once it, it's more graphical uh, in a map sense, it's very easy for them to relate and then respond to our questions or uh, to work on the discussions between the different stakeholders. So I think lastly, another key point that we would like to share is the importance of uh, consistently sharing perspectives raised in each participatory activity uh, to future activities. So this is quite a mouthful. Essentially what I'm trying to say is that you have a participatory activity with a specific group of participants. Whatever discussions that they have raised should be shared with future activities so that this, this this ongoing exchange of ideas, cross-pollination of learnings and insights, for example, will continue. And as mentioned, it is, it is impossible for us to hold a 200,000 strong workshop with everyone to share their ideas. So it's impossible, uh, it's, it's possible instead for us to try to facilitate that through our different participatory activities by, keep, by constant, consistently sharing all of these findings itself. Um, 
this is especially important, of course, uh, in, in, in light of the physical distancing requirements from COVID-19. So rather than having a group of 20 in a single workshop, sometimes if participation is necessary, break it up to groups of four uh, and con connect them, for example, through a laptop, through, through Zoom itself, so that they know what's going on in the, the other workshops itself. So yes. Uh, I, I, sorry, time is very tight and this is really a quick overview of the, the kind of analysis and evaluation that we have so far. And we will definitely rec uh, hope for uh, you all to come to this link that we have shared in the chat itself to offer your feedback. You could paste your note, uh, sticky notes anywhere and share with us all kinds of points from even just the graphics to the contents to insights and experiences for your, from your own context itself. Um, so lastly, before I end off this presentation, I would like to share uh, more about the, the publication itself, not just the content. So I think, um, sorry, this, this document itself is and will be heavily influenced by existing materials, such as the IKEA manual, among others. I think um, it, it's very important that the IKEA manual is a, it's a key reference point because we felt that it is a very accessible approach such that anyone, especially layman, can understand the, the processes and uh, follow through it, for example. Um, so yes, if the, if the content is about participation, then the presentation of the publication itself should also be interactive and participatory. So these are some of the, the kind of references that we are looking at right now to develop this publication, not just in terms of content, but also the way it's presented. So for example, Roadmap for Research, uh, which is a very recent and good publication, uh, offers a good insight into how plain language can be used to bring across technicalities to the layman, especially the community. You and have that place making, sorry? Yeah, 30 seconds to wrap up. No problem. Yeah, the last two publication, Placemaking Toolkit and Participatory Incremental Urban Planning Toolkit, demonstrates the importance of graphics in guiding laymen through potentially complex processes. So yeah, I, I guess we don't really have any more time to discuss. So feel free to come to the link and share your feedback or just email me and or Jia Chong. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Thanks a lot, Bernard. And thanks for sharing the link um, to the mural in the chat. I think there's a lot of things in there that's CAM managers will find really interesting and very common between the processes that you and Habitat are outlining and some of the mechanisms that CCCM uh, already do are enabled to <clears throat> help with the, you know, with implementation of this of this process. Um, so thanks very much. Um,